Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 240 of App Percussion Podcast. Today is June 28th, and we will be releasing this episode on July 23rd. My name is Ksenia Komjanovic, and with me are my co-hosts, as always, Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. Carly Vigna. Hello, everybody. And the man of the hour, the inventor of this great podcast, Casey Cangelosi. whoop de doop de doo <laughs> Um, before we introduce uh, our fantastic guest today, we will be discussing our competition winners. For those of you who follow us on social media, which you should do, uh, find us on Facebook, uh, you have heard of the introduction music contest, the 8 to 16 seconds, all ages, any style, any method, must be original work, must be unpublished. And the entry fee was a mere $300 because Casey mm -hmm. thought that it was worth it. Um, yeah. But Casey, will you tell us a little bit about the results? Yeah, sure. So you just heard some new intro music and I let my co-hosts judge and I just gave input. But that was by Reese Maltzby. He's been a regular listener of the podcast for a while and he happens to be my student. But I promise. <laughs> no politics. <laughs> I, I, no politics. I have the screenshot to prove it. It was y'all's votes that uh, picked this as number one. He had two first place votes. votes. So that was by Reese Maltzby, and he called it uh, Playing in the Sand. We also wanted to mention the uh, other, other intros that we discussed and considered, and we're going to call these second and third uh, places, too, and then some honorable mentions. So uh, from Poland, um, and maybe, Mariana, you can help me with this name, Antek Oslik. Oslik? Always sick. Always Yeah, good news is what this is called. Like a TED talk, I think. <laughs> oh, it yeah. is. Right? Like it oh, has I that. I didn't pick that up, yeah. Right? It has that like bing at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, third place, also from Poland, Bartek Miller. Yeah. Correct, our friend. This is hard. It's really hard to write anything interesting that lasts. I think I said it has to be between 9 and 16 seconds. And some of the entries were, were far longer. And it's tough. It's really hard to write something like short and snappy and something that's kind of neutral as far as an emotion, you know? Like you, you don't want it to be like too peppy. You don't want it to be a bummer. But yeah, it's, it's tricky. So uh, another one that we all liked uh, from uh, Fox Sebastian Lopez, who's a high schooler, and something they wrote in, they said, um, I've listened to the podcast. I thought it was a cool idea to try to submit something to put on my college resumes. And so, yeah, congratulations, Fox. We're going to use your intro music as well on some of the episodes, and you can say that uh, you were selected. So, uh, yeah, here's a, the piece called The Pod that Fox wrote. So, and one more, this was my favorite one. Sorry, Reese, I know I'm your teacher, but this was my first place vote, but unfortunately my co-hosts felt differently. And it's by Luigi Morello, and, uh, and he's, he's from Italy, so here is his piece. So thanks for participating. That was fun. That was fun for us. It means I don't have to write intro music. And uh, yeah, congratulations to everybody. We're going to use these in a lot of episodes. I don't know, probably for the next 50 or so, we'll be using them off and on. But uh, we'll be principally using uh, Reese Maltzby's piece. So yeah, thanks, y'all, for entering. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. It was really cool to listen to all the great ideas and then ultimately have a fight among the co-hosts about who should win. <laughs> We made, so much, we made a lot of money. We made so much money, uh, 300 per entry. That 300 was, per entry, yeah, we made a lot. $300 that we made, no. Um, yeah. No, but that was great, and I think we should keep doing this. Um, all right, so now I get to introduce our wonderful guest. I'm so excited about this. Um, our guest for this episode is Mariana Bednarska. Mariana Bednarska is a recognized soloist. Hi, Mariana. Sorry, I will talk a lot about you, but say Hi. <laughs> 
Hi. <laughs> hey, um, so that was the voice of a fabulous uh, soloist, chamber and orchestra musician. Uh, she has performed in Poland, the USA, Germany, Austria, Holland, Denmark, Belgium, France, Switzerland, Italy, Croatia, Bulgaria, and Ukraine. You can't even name those countries that quickly off the top of your head. Um, she studied with everyone from uh, Henryk Mikolajczyk in Warsaw to Marta Klimasara, another fantastic Polish percussionist in Stuttgart, and Philippe Spicer in Geneva. Um, she has won so many awards, and not even all of them are listed on her website, um, but some of the cool ones that she has won um, include the second prize in the Yamaha Special Young Artist Prize at the 74th Concours de Genève in uh, 2019, and wow. then my uh, fake uh, French accent Prix Credit Suisse Jeune Soliste uh, 2019 um, uh, Grand, Grand Prix at the International Music Competition Encore in 2018. Then the second prize and the special prize, Best Performance of a Belgian Composition at the Universal Marimba Competition of the Belgian Queen. That's Belgium 2017. Then I'm going to, all of these are first and special prizes. So International Percussion Competition at Northwestern in Chicago, 2016. International Marimba Competition in Bamberg, Germany, 2016. International Marimba Competition in Paris, 2009. In Fermo, Italy, 2008. International Percussion Competition in Plovdiv, Bulgaria, 2007. And she was also finalist in the National Eurovision Competition, Young Musician of the Year in 2019. She's won so many scholarships from the Polish government and the Swiss government. And she was awarded the Polish-Danish uh, Friendship Prize for her close connection with the Danish musical life, culminating in the CD recording of Anders Koppel's four marimba concertos, published by the Kapo Records in 2014, which received, pos received positive reviews from the New York Times, Gramophone Magazine, Deutschlandfunk, Fanfare Magazine, etc. I mean, to summarize, she's... She's all right. No, she's great. Mariana is amazing and has been one of my heroes since I was a kid. So Mariana, welcome to the podcast. So lovely to have you. Hi, thank you so much for having me and thank you for all the wonderful words for your big introduction. <laughs> and yeah, it's such a pleasure uh, to be with you, to see all of you. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Oh, it's so lovely to have you. Um, we're going to start off with Ben, because I have a lot of questions, but let's have Ben speak a bit. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I wanted to start out with a question. So uh, Carly and I, and I think maybe Ksenia as well, studied at Frost School of Music in Miami uh, with a Polish percussion student named Maria Klebus, uh, who is also one of Kashka's students. And uh, Maria, uh, Maria was a fantastic player. Uh, well, still is a fantastic player. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I remember distinctly talking to Maria one time about Kashka's recording of Merlin. And Maria said, I just, I love it so much. It's so Polish. Like everything about it is just Polish. It's just fast and loud. And, and like she, she seemed to speak very highly of this Polish marimba style. So Mariana, could you tell us uh, in your opinion, what, what is the sort of uh, definition of the Polish style of marimba playing? Yes, so you're right. There's uh, so many wonderful recordings, uh, also from the Polish virtuosos like Katarzyna Metka or Marta Krimasara. And um, this piece is one of the most important positions also for Polish percussionists. And I think this style which you are talking about, it's like very, you know, Slavonic. There's a lot of um, energy and, uh, you know, with the warm blood, like playing uh, with this passion. And um, actually, through knowing so many styles uh, in many countries, I can see a little bit these differences, like uh, in Germany, France, and I, I see like in Poland, Bulgaria or Croatia, they're really like um, very characteristic uh, aspects of playing uh, the marimba as well. And I was very lucky to uh, start my marimba adventure with Katarzyna Metka as well. And she gives me so much uh, background in the marimba music and I'm extremely happy to, to experience that. Um, after I, I also uh, went to Stuttgart to study with Marta and uh, with other teachers uh, there, like also with the orchestra and uh, pedagogical aspects. And here in Geneva, it's more contemporary, so the style is uh, also a little bit different. We work a lot with, with composers and uh, with multimedia, with uh, videos, with electronics. So I could experience all of these different styles as well. And uh, relating to my own style, I think it's all um, a big mix of everything I could experience. So I'm very happy for all of these adventures on my musical path. That's wonderful. Um, I had a, a sort of sub-question, something that I've thought about um, a lot. It's when we hear about, you know, the Polish, 
especially those uh, percussionists who have made their careers abroad, um, a lot of them happen to be female. Um, and that's not the case in a lot of other countries. Oh, wow, Casey, you've got a, a giant cat on your screen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that's Lou Cat. She's huge. She's, she, is a, she is a big cat. Look at yeah. that tail. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Can she stay there? <laughs> I'm sorry. You guys need to see this. Don't listen to the podcast. Go see the podcast so you can see this. Um, but wait, go, going back to being serious, um, just looking at the, the you know, senior generation of Kashka and Marta, and then looking at you, while you're not senior by any stretch of the imagination, you have a very serious career. And then we know of these other wonderful percussionists like Bartek and Antek, who are maybe a little bit uh, younger. Um, so how how did that happen? Especially Poland is a very, uh, is a what I know of Poland is a society that is very traditional in values. And I think in many ways is part patriarchal society. Yeah. Um, but the female percussionists have definitely pushed through so much. Do you have any idea why? How come? Absolutely. Um, I don't think there is any special reason for that. I think we have a very talented and wonderful uh, virtuosos and musicians. Also, my big mentors are female because uh, my first teacher was my aunt and she still is a percussionist and she introduced me to this world of percussion. Actually, after the war, she was uh, the one who helped to ground the percussion, uh, you know, to put it back after the big break after the war. And uh, she also educated many important percussionists. So uh, one day she just invited me to the percussion concert because I was playing the piano from the beginning. And I went there and immediately I know it would be like my path and I'm dropping the piano and from today I want to play only uh, percussion and she really gave me this love uh, for these instruments. So yeah, this is also uh, important women in my musical life like the others you said. Uh, and yes, it's very often said that there are some, um, you know, recognitions with men as a percussionist. And I think it maybe comes from this stereotype that the percussion is uh, still recognized as an um, instrument in the band. So it's like a percussionist with the muscles who has to, you know, play loud the rhythm. And still many people ask me, wow, you're a girl. Why did you choose this instrument? And it happens in Poland often. I, I hear these questions. Why the girl with percussion? And I think still uh, many people um, recognize it with the drums, maybe not with m completely melodic instruments like marimba or vibraphone. And I think maybe that the reason that there is so many melodical um, aspects of this instrument, so many sound possibilities, that also uh, it's kind of the, you know, female research on that or uh, it's kind of um, searching for other possibilities. So maybe that's also the reason, but I'm very happy to meet these people in my life as well. Wonderful. I just have a, a question or comment for, for everybody. Do, do you think it's because percussion is just new? You know, I think of Kashka playing marimba, Keiko Abe playing marimba. I know we've talked to somebody here. I, I want to say it was a timpanist, um, but conduct like someone won a job, a timpani job, and the curtain went down and it was a female timpanist. And the conductor said, yeah, you played great, but I'm just not used to seeing a female timpanist we're just not used to seeing that like 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 almost almost in a sense of like when i go looking for the timpanist i'm not looking for you and i'll like i'll get lost in the you know in, you know it, 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 oh, i don't remember who the heck we were talking to but i kind of wonder if there's more acceptance towards marimba and other percussion things just because they're there's less history you know there's less history there what do you what do, what do you guys think oh yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that might be true, definitely. I mean, we've seen the marimba less on stage than we have seen timpani, but I don't think that that conductor has, uh, I mean, that's not justified to be like, oh, I'm sorry, I just don't see the women. I, I simply, oh, my brain is programmed not. to like, I see the drums, but there's no one behind it. Oh, of course <laughs> it's not justified. No, 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 of, cor of course not. I'm just trying to, um, I'm trying to offer a hypothetical well, explanation I, I, for what that be. I had a little thing I wanted to add, and I, re I actually remember hearing Carly say something about this when we were in Miami, 
um, about, I think percussion is perceived as a, a physical instrument. And I remember Carly said, someone said to her like, oh, I just, it's, it's so incredible to believe that like someone of your stature can make like such a big sound. And like, I think it, there's like this comparison with like weightlifting or something, which you obviously genetically men are bulkier and, you know, muscles and can generally genetically lift more weight. But like, to, you know, to play a snare drum loud doesn't really take any like muscular, like macho strength or anything like that. So I, I don't like, I, I guess that's my, uh, that's been my takeaway as to why it's perceived as a quote unquote masculine instrument. The uh, mallets but, are only a few ounces, yeah. and we we, I mean, we do carry I mean, marimbas, but we're in good shape, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the, if you're putting enough pressure into you know a marimba key that actually requires muscle, you're probably damaging the instrument, uh, <laughs> or or <laughs> instrument. Um, so yeah, I, don't know, I think it's maybe. And it also yes, and also another thing that I hear very often after the concert is like, how do you transport it by yourself? It's so big and there are so many instruments, you need so many muscles and yeah, that's also this kind of thinking as you said. Well, you know what, that, what, other than other than timpani, like most of our instruments, like you don't pick up a whole marimba like ever. You uh, don't? I, I mean, I do. I do but. <laughs> <laughs> but like what about harp? Like I see female harpists moving their harps around all the time. Like harps are yeah. incredibly difficult. Right. To move. Just lift and, yeah. so I, I don't know, like, they all do it. Yeah, they all do it. So I don't, I, I'm the same person who would say like, oh, how did you move your, that marimba around all your, by yourself? Like, what do they think of harpists? Do they just think like, oh, that's nice of your boyfriend to help you with your harp? No, or, they have little fairies that help them. Maybe that's it. The harp fairies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Sorry. laughs> Yes, but as Casey said before, maybe that's also a kind of uh, thing that's, yeah, the percussion is the kind of very young instrument with a young history, young uh, repertoire. So maybe with some instruments, it's a big shock. And uh, when we see the woman as well, I think there can be so many aspects. And But the most great is that music connects everyone and we don't see any divisions or anything. And that's really cool. I've noticed nobody's talking about Marimba Lady. Oh my God, the Marimba Queen? Marimba Lady. I was, Marimba Lady, oh sorry. The shortest. I was, shortest. I was actually talking to, not even kidding, a colleague about her, I think two nights ago. I know the guy that taught Marimba Lady. No. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I, think should, the, I think we should acknowledge what Mar all that Marimba Lady has done for us. I'll, I'll give you the, the, the very, very brief Cliff Notes version. Of, Mar Mariana, are you familiar with Marimba Lady? Has it made it to Okay, <laughs> international. Uh, so uh, I, I can't remember all the exact details, but to make a long story short, she was, uh, uh, I think, a graduate student and she was in the Miss America pageant and uh, she was going to do very well in every round except for she had no talent. Um, and for some reason, she decided she wanted to play the marimba as her talent. And so she asked a uh, professor, can you give me lessons? And he said, no, I won't. But he gave her the name of a student that could give her lessons. And uh, she started coming to her lessons and was learning everything by rote, couldn't read music or anything. Uh, and my friend that taught her said she was actually doing fairly well. Uh, and then she started asking, well, can we talk about like visually, like what can I do with the mallets to like look flashy? He's like, well, I think we should maybe focus on the, you know, the music. <laughs> And every single week she came back and she wanted to do more and more of that. And then eventually she just stopped showing up. <laughs> she had to practice the throwing of mallets behind her back. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, you, you, know, you know the end of that story. So. <laughs> wow, to think that the easiest way to hide that you have no talent is to go behind the marimba. I, to, That's to her pretty credit, messed though, up. I'm like, I, if you had to pick a marimba, or, uh, sorry, an instrument that you could fake pretty easily, I mean, like compared to like a trumpet or a flute, or even if you can't sing, I think there's actually a pretty low bar of entry for marimba playing just to be able to play something. You can make a sound, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> Don't that was pretty intonation. fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, that was funny. Uh, Carly, you had something. I did. You know, we were talking about. 
a, a, before before marimba lady just on on kind of gender representation and i've been coming back to this you know more and more recently with every every conversation that's happening right now how important representation is and seeing you know kashka who's this amazing role model there i'm sure has an influence on women in poland um seeing this as a dream and a reality and we have amazing role models here too but i i guess just for me seeing like how important this is and for a long time I didn't realize and I didn't think it was as important as it is, but it's huge, you know, just this power of seeing someone like me doing something. And then you have this this maybe completely subconscious thought of, hey, I could do that, too. Yeah, yeah. And I think for me, uh, Mariana was a big part of that. I remember I started playing percussion a little bit late and I remember I would go to my mom's office because I didn't have Internet at home to like stay on YouTube forever. And then there was this video titled something like 15 year old Mariana Benarska plays couple concerto. And I remember I was 17. So I had just started playing percussion and I was just like, this is amazing, but it's already over. I've already lost the race. <laughs> I am 17 and I just picked up snare sticks. I had the same experience actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, again, it was so inspiring because I saw someone young and who obviously worked so diligently and played so well in front of an orchestra and I thought wow this is possible to, which I thank you so much for uh, Mariana. Well it's so nice to hear that thank you so much it was so so long time ago it was more than 10 years when I look at the time right now it's well surprising it goes so fast yeah but it was always my dream to play this uh, first uh, uh, concerto under Orchestra and actually was the CD with um, Marimba Concertos of Kashka and uh, I got so inspired with this music and with Underscope I said wow one day I would like to perform it so much and uh, there was an opportunity in my school like uh, the graduation students they could perform with the orchestra and I was happy to do it and after my dad he because he was filming with the camera and he said okay like let's put it on YouTube and with the whole description, 15 years old and everything. And yeah, that's how it started. And that's so nice to remind it, really. <laughs> that's that's really lovely. And thank your dad for, for thinking of that so we could find out about you early on. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your collaboration with Anders? Because this has turned into a really fruitful collaboration and then you ended up uh, recording all four of his concerti, which is pretty impressive. Yes, exactly. So this video uh, was kind of a big gift for me because uh, one day Anders was able to see this in the internet and uh, he wrote to me an email and said, I'm extremely happy with your performance and uh, I wish uh, someday you could record all of my concertos. And I was like, wow, so surprised that he wrote to me and that he liked it, that my performance and kind of interpretation somehow uh, was adjusted to his uh, tastes of music and everything and uh, I thought yeah that would be such a big dream if it happens someday and there was some time um, like I was doing my stuff and being in the school and I got this uh, email from Anders again that uh, we have the call recording company we are ready to do that would you agree and of course, it was such an amazing thing for me. And I found out also there are many concertos of Anders, uh, like um, four of them. And each of the concertos has a different problematic, different orchestra um, instruments inside. And uh, I was extremely happy I can do that. So uh, in the meantime, we met once with Anders. Uh, we were practicing because first session was about recording number one and number three. Uh, because of the similar orchestra instruments as well. Uh, so we met once in Warsaw, he came to my home and we were working together and he is such a wonderful human as well, not only a great musician and amazing composer, but I remember like he was really encouraging me in uh, the best way, but also he's kind of person that always tells you strict what he wants and I like that very much because uh, it's honest and I know what I should work on. So uh, in this time we did this job and after half of the year later we met in Orburg in Denmark to record everything. So it was the first recording session ever in my life and uh, everybody was really supportive. It was a lot of work because, uh, you know, all of the pieces are different and there was the graduation and all the things happening at the same time. But it's 
really such an amazing experience and, and after one year I could finish with number two and number four. So that's how the whole recording story went and it was really amazing. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity and that Anders appreciated uh, the music that I performed. So that's how it happens with the big shortcut, you know. <laughs> So, correct me if I'm wrong, but Anders Koppel has four concertos from Marimba? Exactly. Uh, yes. And has he, has he, did he say, I want to write four and then cut it? Or is there, is there going to be a fifth? Do we know anything? <laughs> I, I think he, it was just, a, you know, inspiration and uh, it comes also naturally for him because um, often when I write emails with him or we speak, he's like, like on his in his um, cottage house or on his island there like having so many ideas in his head to compose so uh, i think it's just a natural way of thinking what he wants to write and but but it's great to have all four of them anyway it's i i actually did a project on his his music when i was in graduate school and i i i loved all of it and one of the most interesting ones was i think it was the second marimba concerto maybe the third was written for actually a Mozart festival. And yes. People very said, cool. why, why are you writing a marimba concerto for a Mozart festival? Because the marimba didn't, wasn't around when Mozart was composing. And he said, well, Mozart was famous for his, you know, writing for piano and clarinet. And he said, in today's age, I see the marimba at the place where those instruments were in Mozart's age, which I thought was like a very like, learned answer to that question so mm -hmm. yeah very very cool concertos that's very cool yeah. yes uh, so because i said it's number three but i uh, it's number four because uh, probably uh, you say about the concerto when there was a, a piece of his of music of mozart involved in the concerto there is the uh, um, you know the part of the piece so it was kind of the tribute also to Mozart in this concerto. And there is a big um, orchestra as well. It's not only like a big symphonic thing, but also with the organs. And it sounds just really, really amazing with all of this tutti. And it's such a cool experience to play this piece. That's awesome. Um, I wanted to ask, I mean, you've obviously started your career while you were very young, I, I don't know, in high school, let's say that that's, uh, that's valid to say, and you've done so many projects that are so serious while you were in school. And from what I know, you've graduated, uh, you got your master's degree in June last year, right? Exactly, yes. Right, yes, and then you, in right, and then you had uh, the Geneva competition later that fall, but um, how has life changed for you since you graduated? Have you set up your own studio? Is it strange to not go to school? How is life now? Yes, in the school it was all kind of very natural for me because uh, I was practicing and I had my parents next to me, so it was, you know, easy. They helped me with everything and I had my instruments at home as well. And since I moved uh, to Stuttgart, it was a little bit more difficult. Of course, you're living on your own and you have to do everything by yourself and you learn how to be a major person. So that definitely changed me uh, from the person like I was in the high school. And uh, yes, exactly. In, the, in Geneva, I, uh, I have also uh, here my own flat and some small instruments. But uh, fortunately, not yet at the big studio, but the conditions in the university are very good. So I don't regret of anything for now. And I am now doing the postgraduate studies in Geneva. So still there is uh -huh. half of year uh -huh. yet to fit to graduate uh, my postgraduate studies. So yes, I finished the master's June and now in January it will be the end of postgraduate studies here in Geneva. Yeah, that changed a lot and I think it also influenced my music a lot because I'm uh, more conscious about who I am now and what I want in music and it's it's really nice to, you know, um, be conscious about all of this happening around you. I was going to ask, can you, can you tell some of our young listeners, I think a lot of people understand what it takes to play a concerto well, to learn music, to have good technique. How do you how do you start a career or, or how did it happen for you where you started engaging with orchestras and you set up a tour, you performed all these places? Like, how do we 
what, what are the first steps to, to starting to make that happen? So honestly, it always came very naturally for me because I was doing my things in the school and the projects and there was always someone writing an email to me or taking a phone and okay, would you like to engage with this or this project? So the first project with orchestra was uh, with this Copper concerto on the video on YouTube. And then slowly it started to expand more and more because at the concert there were some people who noticed that I'm playing and okay, why would you to play here with us or uh, abroad? And so slowly this path started somehow naturally to expand. Uh, and I was always trying to do my best, you know, in the practice room and to give my best to the pieces and the rest I was trusting that it will somehow create but by itself. So um, I'm happy it went like that and I, I never like thought mm, now I'm having a big career and I have to go to China or USA, I don't know, to do many things. But I was just uh, adjusting to the all the conditions that are happening to me and just doing my best with the music. So many, many good experiences on this way. And mm -hmm. that went like that. Mm. So, so maybe some real simple advice is, hey, go win competitions. Yeah. Because you've won a lot of yeah, contests, Yeah, we can right? say, I mean, competitions, generally, when you think about them, it's like, okay, I go there to get famous, to get some prize, and um, maybe often people think that it will expand the career. Of course, it's a good kick and good start, but for me, it's also always uh, like a great opportunity to expand my repertoire, to know better myself, to challenge myself, to know people, and just to, you know, go ahead and develop myself. Of course, some of the competitions are a wonderful way to develop your career if you have an, an management after because they are building your career. And uh, of course, if I would have to give an advice to young people, I would say absolutely try everything you can and gain as much experience as you can and do your best because whatever you do, it will, it will suit you after. You can choose from so many experiences in your life and, you know, create your own path after. So I think it's important to try as much as possible. Yeah, it just, it's good to hear you say that because I've, I've heard several students in particular say like, why aren't university professors training us how to do this? And my answer is always, well, there's no deep secret and to how you write an email, you're, you're not just going to make cold calls and cold emails to music directors and they'll hire you. That's not going to happen. Like you need to have some accolades and some visibility. And my time with you as a teacher is just to make you really, really good and hopefully help you win some of those types of things if that's what the type of career you want. And that's what's going to make you visible and noticed. And then all of a sudden when you do, if you do make a cold call to a music director, they'll have some reason to pay attention so yes, yeah yeah so I, I don't get the big mystery with these questions sometimes yes yes and it also helps you to suit into uh, unknown conditions so you know stress and and everything you're checking yourself in an unknown way so after if you have this call as well or you make some contact it's less easy for you it's more easy for you to do all of these things which are challenging as as well so it gives a lot of experience i think in every aspect of life cool um i was gonna go off of that and uh talk to you i guess because you have such a wonderful career see if management is anything that um you see any value in or you've you know had a had conversations about obviously we're not asking so for private details of your life but just knowing about some other young percussionists um, a lot of them search for this management as like the holy grail. They think if that happens, they will all of a sudden opportunities will open up. Um, and I'm just wondering, I don't know if that's the case in around Europe. It's mostly the talk of the town in, in the US. Mm -hmm. So yes, also I got a lot of questions if you have your own management and uh, how is this career, how did it went for you and um, until today I always, you know, as I said before, that was not really for me, I got some propositions and I was just happy to receive it and to go with this way. 
but yeah, that's it. That's uh, that's kind of thinking that if you got an agency, then you will have a great start in your career. And of course, there are many wonderful agencies which are helping you. And sometimes it's very, uh, you know, very dangerous subject because um, when the people see percussion is a young instrument, they see a big chance to promote also themselves on your um, way, or let's say, and it's always a matter of people who you will meet on your way. And um, I think it's nice to be, you know, careful about that and work really, really hard. And I always believe uh, that it all comes to you naturally. And someday if you work hard and if you do your job, it will be like just natural and it will come and you will have a great engagement and everything. And also this is very challenging because with all the tours and, and thing that the agency are organizing, it's uh, sometimes it brings a lot of time. And if you are a very young musician, you still have to have time for your uh, normal life, you know, to meet friends, uh, you know, to go to the cinema, to make a party or anything. So to keep this balance in life and sometimes it's, it's a very busy job to do all of the concerts and I, I would say it's nice to have balance in life because it also influences how you play and what you do with your music. So that's my personal opinion on that. But of course it happens you can meet a great agency and have a wonderful career. So I wish I wish everybody to have this perfect situation. Marianne, you mentioned the importance of balance in our in our lives, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you've specifically done, because you're, as Xenia said, your career started when you were very young. What do you do to maintain balance, um, maybe earlier and also now, and, you know, maintain your mental health and stay happy and healthy and all of that? Yes, yeah, so now it's much, much easier because uh, it, I'm after the Geneva competition and all the contests which happened, and I finished my master, and before, uh, maybe when I started my studies in Stuttgart and I had bachelor with all these theoretical lessons in the university and all of the things next to that, you know, the administration, learning, learning the language, it was really hard to um, give some time to myself to relax really well, but I always tried to get engaged with the sports. This is a very important aspect for me, especially now I'm trying to do a lot of workouts, a lot of yoga. I love to run, so every time I have this moment, I do my best to have some activity. And, you know, just sometimes also when you are practicing to have this moment to separate your head completely from the work, to take a cup of coffee, go outside on the sun, you know, just to completely turn off uh, from the music and do something that will remind you that you are still a normal person. And of course, contact with people. And what I loved with the people I met on my way, both in Warsaw, Stuttgart, in Geneva, I always had this luck to, ha to have a great family, the class like a family, you know, so we were spending time together and lunch and doing the parties after so uh, it's nice i think to stay open for all the contacts and remember about that and for me it's great to go out to the nature as well in geneva i'm lucky because there is a lake and the mountain so it's perfect i don't have to go anywhere just you know take a small hike or anything just like uh, things connected to nature whatever whatever it takes see the movie or just sleep longer, go to the shopping. Yeah, that are, that are the things that I like to do. So so I'm, I'm curious, is this something, like we're talking about how do you relax, how do you get out of your practice space and into a relaxed space? Is this something you spend effort to organize and you're very methodical about, okay, I'm going to practice this much, then I'm going to relax, and then I'm going to practice, and then I'm going to relax? Because I, I often feel like <laughs> like I'm teaching at the Ted Cats percussion seminar right now. And a lot of the students ask this and they say like, what should I be doing in like my off time and how should I relax? And in a way I think like, well, you should just relax. Like if you're being methodical about how you're relaxing, <laughs> not relaxing. <laughs> that's not relaxing. Like, and, and the way you're explaining it, Marianne, and please correct me if I'm wrong. It just seems like you're just like naturally relaxing. It's like, well, yeah, I practice yes. and I want to break and I'm going to, I'm going to go do that. But, but something I, I talked about on the show a long time ago was it, it seems like a very, a thing that happens in the USA. We plan our vacations for work. We don't just, we don't actually relax very much. 
And when we do relax, it's planned, methodical relaxing so that we can be recharged for work. So anyway, that, that was like a long explanation for this simple, simple question. But is it like super methodical? Is it scheduled or is it just, it's no. natural? For me, it's totally natural. And sometimes yeah. I go with the flow and I want to work because it's going good. And I want, okay, take this and the next piece, the next piece. And sometimes I'm like, okay, today I go to the lake because I need it. Or I practice and I just feel, okay, I just need 10 minutes to go, go out. And I think it will help me to go to practice better. So I just try to feel myself and trust myself as much as I can. Of course, there were some moments between the big competitions when I did, it was impossible to relax that much. And uh, I tried to, you know, I don't know, make some stretching on breathing exercise or anything, but it's not always easy, I know, and uh, it can be very difficult, but I never planned it. As you said, if you plan it, it's also not the real <laughs> relaxation. So exactly. exactly. I think that is fair. It's a difference I've seen, I feel like, in USA versus Europe. Yeah, definitely. And many, the and many other places. Yeah, yeah, South America too, for sure. I find that to be a really interesting argument in the US culture is whenever you're trying to tell people that they should relax, the way that you're going to convince them if they're workaholics, you're, you tell them that they're going to work better if they're relaxed. Exactly. Uh, which <laughs> sort of defeats because it's like, no, you're supposed to just be able to loosen up. Um, but right. yeah, it's Because it, <laughs> then you do think we'd have less COVID here if people weren't so obsessed about working? Oh, that's a highly political debate, and I don't get to vote what? in this that's country. An easy, so. That's an easy yes. That's an easy <laughs> certainty. There, yes, I will. I say what you want me to say. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm. I uh, no. I just want everyone to be happy and healthy, and it'd be great if if governments worldwide could assist their people, especially in times like these, so that people don't have to work. That'd be lovely. I understand the people's urgency to work in the U.S. Um, however, we'll see what the price uh, will pay for that. But that's enough of politics because we're here to talk about music, which is way better. Um, and we're going to now talk about uh, other things that can enhance our performance. Carly has a little cool thing for us here. So, yeah, thanks, Ksenia. I came across this podcast. Some of you may know of Noah Kageyama. Um, he works sometimes with Rob Knopper. They collaborate on some things. Um, he has a podcast called The Bulletproof Musician, and this particular episode was released in 2019, and it's about pre-performance rituals, and I just thought it was really interesting. Yeah. So he's talking about um, some, some like seemingly random pre-performance rituals. We could even call them like superstition. He talks about Italian singers, even Pavarotti was included, would not go on stage until they found a bent nail somewhere back stage and I think like I mean I, I guess there are nails backstage I don't know that one seems a little crazy um, but then of course there's other like more more logical um, pre performance rituals like like we've all heard of visualizing everything going exactly how you want it to go right we visualize success maybe some deep breathing or some exercises to release tension like okay that seems all of that seems like a good idea um, and and so what was particularly surprising to me about this this episode in the, the podcast was he was talking about this has been research there's been studies and in this study there were researchers where people were asked to perform, I think they, they had to sing the first verse of Don't Stop Believing by Journey, and they were going to be judged based on, like, accuracy, pitch, all, all, all different um, uh, all different parts, of, like, ways to be accurate, duration, tone quality, all of that. Um, and so they were split into two groups of participants, and half the participants were told to do this ritual where they drew a picture of how they were feeling, sprinkle some salt on it, count to five out loud, crinkle up the paper and throw it in the trash. So seemingly like ridiculous random tasks, right? But they're, they're told this is the pre-performance ritual. And then they go out and they, they sing the first verse of Don't Stop Believing. Um, and so in the first, first version of this study, they were asked right after performing, how did you feel like rate your anxiety level um, after performing? And compared to the group that did this ritual, compared to the group that 
didn't do anything specific, um, the group that performed the ritual felt less anxious about their performance. Um, so then there's another version of the study where instead, basically the same, but instead of just being asked to rate their anxiety, their, their pulse, their heart rate was actually tested. And it was the same finding that the people that did this, this ritual, as opposed to nothing before performing, had a, a lower level of anxiety and lower heart rate. So how powerful, because this is like, did drawing the picture and sprinkling the salt, like, is there some magic in it? No, of course not. Um, but there's one caveat that if they called this ritual, instead of saying this is your pre-performance ritual that you're going to perform, um, if they called it like, here, you're going to do these random tasks and then go out and sing the song, it didn't have the same effect. So, wow. Yeah, there was something special about calling it a ritual. They right. said, you have to name it right. that. Yeah. Yeah. So here's here's my thought is, you know, I used to be more superstitious, I think, when I was younger and had like performed less and, you know, everything felt like, OK, I got to do every every little thing, just had less experience. Like I would have these little things, you know, like y'all probably have had the, the pre performance banana. And, you know, I, I had this you guys know fish has omega three fatty acids. That's good for your brain. So I used to have this thing like before performance during the day, I'll have some fish every time like sushi, it didn't matter what kind of fish. <laughs> I still do it sometimes when I can. But you know, it's just like a little thing. Um, and I know it's not like, oh, you have fish and that day you're smarter and you could, you know, you could have a better performer, but it was just a little thing. And as I've gotten older, like I've done less of that. I thought like, oh, I don't need it. You know, it's kind of in my head. But now I'm thinking like, I got to get some random things. Here's what I do like five minutes before I go on stage because apparently it can help. What do you guys say? Is there any, any interesting um, or quirky pre-performance ritual? So I think this is all totally real, and um, but it's it's not a like it's not real in like a ritual way. Like there's no there's nothing magical happening here. It's not like the crinkled paper and throwing the salt over the shoulder actually did anything. But it put their probably put their mind like in a more relaxed place because that's really silly. Like draw something, crinkle it up, throw it over your shoulder. They probably went in there going like, okay, this study is like. Not a big deal. And obviously the mood of these researchers is very light. So yeah, of course it had a very real effect. And it reminds me, I think, I swear it was on our show. I don't remember. Or it was in a when I was sharing a master class with him. But Gordon Stout, I'm, sh I'm sure it was Gordon Stout, he said that any, anytime when he, when he was a student and he was practicing and he like nailed it and he felt really good, he would, I thought he said he would take a pencil and, and poke his palm. Ben, you might remember this if, if it was on the show or not, but he would associate that. <laughs> you don't, this doesn't ring a bell. He would, he would stab his, his, his palm to, 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 to make a, a feeling that associated with the positive performance. And he, he did that regularly. And then what did he do before he went on stage? Well, took a pencil and poked his palm to get his head and his feeling back to that state. So, and that's the same way uh, Dwight on The Office was tricked by Jim to uh, what, what salivate at the sound of the bell when he with the mints or whatever, if you watch The Office. So it's that same just like feeling association in a, in a cue. I guess they call that a, a physical cue. That triggers a, a response. Pavlov reflex. I guess. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 also, did you all know that "Don't Stop Believing" it's all verses and only the chorus is at the end. So it's it's cool to to do song form with that with students because we all know that song, but it does not go like verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, chorus bridge, chorus, chorus, and like it doesn't do anything regular. It's all chorus. It's all verses and then chorus is the end. So think about it, then. I think all of us right now in our heads are like, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> think about it. You, you could argue that some of those verses are pre-chorus. You could argue that. But it never goes, don't stop believing until the, the end. That's the... I saw Steve Smith in the hallway at PASIC warming up for his clinic, and he was just talking to some people and playing, the, playing his little groove from don't stop believing. That's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> but no, I just had a couple things to add. One, Casey said, I think this puts your mind in a relaxed state, but I was going to say maybe relaxed, but also task oriented. Um, 
And then the other thing I wanted to add was like, I think we've all had the experience of sitting outside of an audition room or sitting backstage before a concert and like mentally playing through like our piece in our head. And then you get to that eighth page and you oh wait, wait, no, after the B is it, is it a B flat or does it oh. comes up and, I, and like you start to like in just like at the last minute, like, you know, I've never messed this up in the, if, you know, every single time I've practiced this piece, but you start to like almost ingrain memory slips and so, like, for me, purposefully, before a concert, I don't have a ritual, uh, but, like, I, I I try to not, like, sit there and, like, the last thing you need to be doing is running through the box chacon in your head before you go out to play the box chacon. <laughs> that is just bad news waiting to happen, you know? That's death. <laughs> That's just as bad as when you're thinking, you're, like, two minutes into a piece, like, wow, this is going really great. <laughs> I haven't missed any notes yet. <laughs> it's death. It's so bad. Um, I was going to ask Mariana, do you have any pre-performance rituals, including warm-up? I think that's that's a ritual that's really valuable, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But sometimes also you don't have any possibility to really warm up. I don't know, sometimes there is no marimba or different marimba and you can start to get crazy about that. But I try to, you know, stay cool and just move my hands or anything. Yeah, we can say that's kind of the ritual. But I don't have any special ones. I mostly it's a far uh, reached rituals like this yoga and sport. Like I know if I keep my life in this balance, I know um, I can focus well and be mentally clear inside and somehow it will go and uh, be fine with matter of trust in myself. It can be sometimes hard, I know, but but um, you know, coming back to this ritual considerations, I think, it kind of draws your attention, the pulls your uh, attention away from the problem and gives you some kind of uh, trust, I don't know, to this uh, activity that you're doing. But anyway, it's all you who deal with that. So, you know, we are so much, we, ha we are so powerful, we have so much power and we don't even realize how much we can do for ourselves. And it's all about this, just this self-doubt and stress, which is stopping us. But it's so important to keep going anyway and, and try our best. So, yeah, I don't have any special ritual. Maybe I like to check the room, know how the hall sounds like. Uh, I know that my instruments are fine on the stage and I am kind of ready, you know, dressed and everything, but nothing really special. Yeah, and I was going to point one thing Mariana said is, I mean, I, we're talking about a ritual separate to a warm up here, but I remember Andy Harnsberger talked about, uh, I think he, he does not warm up before performances. I could be wrong on that, but uh, at least he doesn't have a, a ritual because he said there's going to be some point uh, at which you come to a performance and you can't. Um, you know, if your ritual is to find a bent nail backstage, but they've swept before the concert, uh, you you have to go out on stage at a certain point. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I think it like in a way you're almost setting yourself up for failure because I feel like the anxiety would be even that much worse if you didn't have this very specific task that you had performed, um, which maybe is like, I mean, there's obviously a difference between like having a meditation you do 30 seconds before you go on stage versus finding a bent nail, but I don't know, just something to think about. No, absolutely. And I think uh, what Mariana said, which is so smart obviously if you're trying to optimize your performance and to give yourself peace invest in that on a daily basis so daily relax daily dedicate yourself to to just being the best version of yourself and then once the stage comes that's that's the easy part um, but you have to show up every day for yourself um, I wanted to take this conversation uh, and ask Mariana because she is a professional competitor, definitely. She's one of those Olympic types. Um, can you tell us a bit, do you have any advice for those who are preparing for big competitions? I know some people, especially in the US, there's this big uh, orchestra audition culture, right? And I have some fabulous friends with great track records. So they've won a lot of competitions who have, you know, binders, just like books of schedules and they plan everything three months in advance and they know exactly three months ahead of time, I have to know every piece of music. Two months ahead of time, I have to start playing concerts for people. One month ahead of time, I have to play the concerts in the middle of the night, so I'm really uncomfortable. So I get used to being uncomfortable. They have a lot of methods that they put in place. And with your success, I'm sure that you've discovered something 
many people haven't. So can you share some of your best tips and tricks for preparing for competitions? Well, so I never really planned like a big schedule for the competitions. It was always a quick decision for me. Sometimes there was not so much time to prepare, but I tried to do my best anyway, do some small plan. It's uh, sometimes it cannot work really well uh, because we have uh, life situations which sometimes disturb it but uh, at least yeah to have a, a small plan to choose i think the repertoire which we are playing to think uh, about each round about like a recital that like you would like to show um, the most things of your music the characters your personality in the most rich way and uh, also to think when you're practicing that's what I'm also trying to do, not about, you know, the big goal, because sometimes people practice and they already imagine themselves on the stage and sometimes it cannot work very well and we are getting very stressed. So maybe to be in the moment and to focus on this activity which you're doing, not about the final result. And to be, of course, regular, but also to remember about listening to yourself and taking, uh, you know, breaks and relaxations, as we said, in the meantime. And um, of course, remembering that uh, the competition it can, you know, be different. The result, the result is not obvious, so everything can happen. But try to do your best, be as much prepared as you can. If you don't feel very comfortable about the piece, but you know that you can go on the stage and somehow do it, I think you should do it because it's most of all about trying and gaining experience. And um, I think it's nice to challenge yourself with all of that. And I know it's very difficult, but not to you know compare yourself. I, I experienced that many of my friends and of course, of course me, also personally like you're going to youtube and you are seeing this person who plays like wonderfully and i have such a long way to go there and like you know just try to stay focused of on what you are doing like you said xenia just to be the best version of yourself in this practice room to um, try to find your authentic personal language i think it's so important because the competition is about judging we will be always judged by the jury and um, it's it can be dangerous because we can uh, really reduce our um, language in the music uh, in order to adjust to the expectations of the people and the jury but you know to still remember what you want to say and to respect the composer to keep the balance in music but also to say something from yourself and I always think that music is the most important and most of all, if it doesn't work, if you make any mistake, okay, that can happen. And it's just a competition. There will be many competitions in the future. So it's nice just to remember that it happens to have mistakes and we are not perfect, but we can always go for our dreams and try to do it and push ourselves. So. That's that's my personal reflection on the competitions and preparations and everything. <laughs> that so wonderful, I so positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Casey, um, you had a little item for us today, right? There was something important that happened in history. History item. Yeah, usually we do history at the beginning of the show, but we talked about our little intro music, so I thought we'd save this for the end. But yeah, we're releasing on July 23rd, and today, in 1961, the American opera singer and superstar Grace Bumbry becomes the first black singer to perform at the Bayreuth Festival in Germany. So that's a big deal, and it's a shame it took all the way to 1961, but there's a long history with the Bayreuth Festival, and... Of course, big Wagnerian tradition there, which means it's tied to all of Germany's history, which means it's tied to uh, Hitler and all of the uh, support. I guess Hitler gave all sorts of support to the Bayreuth Festival and the Opera House, all the way to, of course, tons of donations. But also he's, he sent funds all over the country to bring people to the Bayreuth Opera House to hear music of Wagner and um, um, that sort of thing. But yeah, so G Grace Bunbury plays the role of Venus in Wagner's Tannhauser. 
and she earns a nickname called Black Venus, and that nickname has stuck with her, I think, still today. Like, and actually, as I was looking, trying to find more about her, I couldn't find much about this when I just looked up her name, but as soon as I put Black Venus into Google, I found all sorts of stuff, and it's a pretty cool story. When they announced they were going to have her play the role of Venus in the opera, of course, they got all sorts of letters. The music director is someone by the name of Violent Wagner, and he got all sorts of letters. The uh, neo-Nazi press, I guess they have a publication or, or something, they said, oh, Wagner's going to be rolling in his grave. And I think that's really impressive because I'm just amazed neo-Nazis care at all about opera in 1961 so i think that's pretty that's a win for opera that they even noticed but uh anyway that so anyway it was like this big controversial step and yeah that's uh she's the first african-american woman to perform on that stage and she got a whopping check this out 42 curtain calls and a standing ovation that lasted 30 minutes so it wasn't just a success. It was like a screaming, good, good, good success. And I thought it was really interesting to, that this came up now because something we're talking about so much right now in the States is how to dismantle systemic racism and things like that. And apparently Violin Wagner's idea was to do exactly this. He's the new director of the, the Bayreuth Opera House. He wants to change how culture views opera in Germany right now and this nationalistic sense of opera and disassociate himself and the opera house from its history. And something that's really cool is that you notice his last name is Wagner. He's Wagner's grandson. So I thought that was a really neat connection and that he was trying to do this. And he, he has these statements saying, uh, you know, Wagner is for everyone. And despite what he used to believe and all, all these sorts of things of what an anti-Semite Wagner was, well, that's not how we're going to use Wagner anymore. And it kind of took a stand on that. I thought it was pretty cool. And just check out, I have a photo for you here of the Black Venus. Check this out. Just put it in the chat here for you guys and I'll edit it in. But look at how badass she is. 42 curtain calls, 30 minutes standing ovation. So... That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. That was cool. She was obviously well worth the role. Yeah. Way over being worth the role. Yeah. Thanks. There's one other little history item, but we can save it till we're done talking about this. Do you have something, Ksenia? Casey, I was I was going to add. Uh, I, is everyone? Is anyone here familiar with the the jazz singer Nina Simone? No. Um, so <laughs> this is a, a phenomenal phenomenal performer. Um, one of my favorite songs she did is she did a, a cover of the Beatles, Here Comes the Sun, which is lovely. Uh, one of her best known songs is called How It Feels to Be Free. But anyway, she was born 1933 and she applied to the prestigious Curtis Institute of Music um, for her you know, college studies on classical piano. And she had a wonderful audition. And by all accounts, she should have been accepted with a scholarship and she was rejected. Um, and it was for, uh, you know, racial reasons and the, the kind of happy end of this story. She actually had a somewhat tragic life, um, but wonderful music. But anyway, the sort of happy end to her story is that a few weeks before her death, which I think was 2003. Um, yeah, 2003, a few weeks before her death, the Curtis Institute actually bestowed an honorary degree upon her to sort of make up for their past transgressions of 50 years earlier. So a little parallel there. That's pretty cool. Uh, I thought, uh, I'm sorry, I, I got cut out uh, due to internet issues, but um, I thought it was really cool. I was reading about Grace Bumbrey and have you mentioned it, Casey, with her not getting into school because I wasn't there? No, I didn't mention no. that. Um, so, yeah, I was going to say uh, what I read, it says at age 17, um, her choir director, upon the urging of her choir director, she entered and won a teen talent contest sponsored by St. Louis radio station KMOX. Prizes for first place included a $1,000 war bond, a trip to New York, and a scholarship to the St. Louis Institute of Music. However, the institution would not accept her because she was black. Embarrassed, the, concert, uh, the contest promoters arranged for her to appear on Arthur Godfrey's nationally televised talent scouts program singing Verdi's aria, O Don Fatale, from Don Carlos. And the success of that performance led to an opportunity to study at uh, Boston University College of Fine Arts. But, oh, you know, cool. 
to think that that performance in Bayreuth, well, it happened in 61, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were able to place a man-made item on the moon in 59, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. but somehow we thought like, no. oh my God, a black person singing, she's good, but is this okay? I mean, it's just right. so mind blowing when you draw those parallels. I know to think there'd be any, any issue or whatever. It, an interesting article, if you want to know more and where I got all my information, it's a JSTOR article by Kira Thurman. And the title is Black Venus, White Beirut, Race, Sexuality, and the Depoliticization of Wagner in Post-War West Germany. It's a short read and it's good. So lots of citations in there. If you want to, if you want to learn more, it's, um, it's cool because this this director, Wagner's grandson, there's a lot of it was controversial for a couple reasons. I mean, of course, there was the obvious like blowback, like the neo-Nazis saying, oh, you shouldn't do this. Wagner would be rolling his grave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that didn't bother anyone. They were going to put it on no matter what. But the the controversial point is, was this a tokenization? You know, what were, were they just using her as a token singer? And was this just for a political purpose? And was it just kind of a, you know, a political move to show, hey, this is how we're changing and, and look at us. And and I think it's no question. Listen to her sing. She's fantastic. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt that um, she absolutely belongs in that role. But people are also saying, why was she selected for this? This was literally her first German speaking role. So, yeah, that in my mind, it's like, oh, yeah, but, no, I, I can I can see how you might question that or whatever. But I mean, yeah, 42 curtain calls and the recording is out there. You can listen to this recording and I've listened to it just a bit. It's, it's wonderful. But, but she had studied with a Wagnerian uh, professional singer before. Is that that. Right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not yeah. it wasn't just pulled out of there. I'm sure that, you know, tokenization is definitely uh, worth talking about. But she had like any other you know, young student with a lot of potential. She had had a lot of instruction in it. So sure. she was definitely qualified for, for the role. But that's a, sure. I think that's a really good piece of history. Thanks for sharing that today. Sure. Um, well, to, to wrap up, I just wanted to go back to Mariana once more and ask you, I know it might be untimely to ask about that now, but um, uh, what, are, what are some of your ideas for the future? If that's even, if that's something that you can envision or if, if none are, you know, happening right now, what is what's your ideal you know career in ten years? In ten years, okay. <laughs> so for like a closest goals, my you know main goal now is to finish this postgraduate studies. I have a um, I'm planning a big spectacle with the premieres uh, of the pieces from composers who uh, wrote the compositions for me. So it's something that I'm really planning right now. It's going to be in June in Geneva. Mm -hmm. So hopefully everything can uh, go well, despite of the current situation with COVID and everything. And um, I'm also having before that um, some small concerts, hopefully it will work. I'm also recording an online concert for the PAS China. So that's, I can see that's kind of new uh, form of performance, you know, with the online uh, things and going through social media um, and also yeah I um, would like to see myself in more in the role of professor of the teacher working with the others that would be really great and um, hopefully I can expand my uh, artistic path not only in a solistic way but also as a chamber music player further and having concerts with the um, Orchestra de Suisse Roman, which I am a supplementary musician of. And well, hopefully it will all go well, not only for me, but only also for the other musicians, because the situation is really difficult at the moment. And I hope very much also to expand the um, percussion repertoire working with the composers, especially that's my activity here in Geneva. We have many young people who are exploring the percussion repertoire, so it's always great to find something new. And also with the new means of expressions like electronics, videos, uh, Kinect, everything possible with the theater. And I want, of course, to expand myself as a musician, as a human, and develop as much as I can. Of course, enjoy life as well so hopefully <laughs> everything will go well <laughs> this is gonna be our, our title for this episode is how to enjoy life with Mariana <laughs> <Bednarska>. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We're so glad to have you on and just wonderful to listen to you speak. You you give off the same energy as you do on stage. You are you just uh, ennoble things. You just shine and you seem very very happy and confident. You are very happy and confident not seem. Sorry, why did I use that word? Um and it's so lovely to to just be around you. So thank you. Thank you. It's a great energy that I become that I'm getting from you. So it's all connected. <laughs> and thank you so much for invitation. It's been a great time and just an honor and pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks to my co-hosts. You guys rock as always. And we'll see everyone on 241. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>